We have some all-stars in the investment community where we're going to talk a little bit about the money that's coming into the ecosystem, the fluidity that's, that's happening at such an aggressive rate within the real estate space. And with me today are, I guess they want me to sit down over here, so let's do that, make it a little bit more comfortable. Hey, Scott. So we'll talk a little bit about following the money. And what we mean by following the money is where venture debt, where private equity, where family funds have all of a sudden found out about one of the oldest industries in the world. When I say an old industry, I mean, it goes back forever. And now it's a $250 trillion market globally, which to put that in context, if you look at the amount of gold in the world, I think the total amount of gold is about $9 trillion that's ever been mined. So it's the biggest industry in the world, but what's interesting about it is that we really haven't had the level of venture capital investment or private equity investment in real estate or real estate technology up until this point, up until the last four to five years. And so the purpose of today's panel is to talk a little bit about the ideas that are being met with this incredible amount of capital. We'll talk a little bit about where the capital is coming from, and uh, we'll get into some of the specifics as to what the ideas and visions for the future of real estate investment will look like. And the reason we wanna do this, especially from a realtor perspective, is because for the practitioners in the audience, where the money flows tends to be where the technologies are gonna be three to five years from now. So if anything, the panelists today represent a Rosetta Stone for where the future of this industry is going. And I'm really, really excited to introduce some of the panelists here just briefly. Um, I wanna start off with uh, Scott Smith here, who is the president and general manager of Constellation Software and Real Estate Group, which focuses on a lot of strategic investments within the real estate space, responsible for a lot of very key acquisitions uh, with real estate technology. Before that, Scott was uh, with Microsoft, and uh, you're also a Washington, Washingtonite down here, down the road in Seattle. Hometown. Great, thanks, man. Thank thanks you. for being here, appreciate it. Also, we have uh, Julie Sandler, who is the Managing Director of Pioneer Square Labs and PSL Ventures, again, right here in Washington, and they have an all-star team of investors, what we'll hear about in a, in a couple minutes, but prior to that, she was a partner with Madrona Ventures, and this past year, it's, it's, I just want to mention the statistic, and I want to make sure I have it right, Julia, is that one out of seven companies in the Washington state area that have received baseline funding, baseline whether venture or seed type funding, came from Julie's Labs. One out of seven, so super impressive. Tech so, based, yeah. yeah, thank you. Tech based, tech based. <laughs> uh, yeah, phenomenal to have you here on stage. Uh, Mr. Ellie Feingold, who is an angel investor, uh, he was the chief innovation officer of CB Richard Ellis, and uh, he also serves as strategic advisor to a number of startup companies and an advisor to, to Metaprop, so thank you, Ellie, for, for being here. And last but uh, definitely not least down there, I think everybody remembers this gentleman from yesterday. Uh, you didn't, you know, you, you, you brought it, man. You brought all sorts of phenomenal questions. Uh, Dino Vendetti, uh, he was, he was a... Uh, he was the Simon Cowell of, of uh, not, not, not in a bad way, but in a really good way. I mean, and, and that's their job, really, is to ask the tough questions to the, to the uh, companies that uh, come in front of their desk. But uh, just to reiterate, Dino is the founder and managing partner with uh, Seven Peaks Ventures here, uh, yeah, just right down the road in Bend, Oregon. So thank you, Dino, for sharing your time with us on stage. But before we get into the, sort of the meat of the questions, I wonder if we could just set the stage in context for everybody and, and quickly go through and talk a little bit about what your own investment thesis is. And I think that that'll help frame up the conversation for everybody. Scott, why don't we start with you? Sure, great. So um, I, I run a portfolio called the Constellation Real Estate Group. We are a buy and hold portfolio. So our investment thesis, we look for post-revenue companies, uh, companies that we can operate and run profitably. Generally not a strategic investor, so we're not looking for somebody that's looking for early growth capital or somebody that has technology that fills out a portfolio. While we find that on a regular basis, uh, we are definitely looking for what I would just say sound business fundamentals. So companies that have a sales strategy, they have a, a nice lifetime value and quite frankly, very strong customer base. 
and it can be in anything, for my, my specific group, anything in real estate or mortgage. So we own 15 software companies in, in those spaces today. They might be back office accounting solutions, relocation, transaction management. And uh, more interestingly, um, as we talk about some of the future stuff, you might have seen Rich Swire from Offers speak yesterday. We just acquired his business and also a competitor called SmartZip. Uh, both are in the big data and AI space. And so super excited by sort of the innovation we can get with those. Great. Uh, so, uh, so my fund, PSL Ventures, is unique in that it's paired with a local startup studio here in Seattle that works with local founders to create new companies from scratch. Uh, our venture fund is an $80 million fund. We invest uh, across uh, sectors, all tech businesses based here in the Pacific Northwest at the earliest stages, uh, you know, pre-seed, seed, series A, uh, most often at the seed stage, so check size kind of in the two to $3 million range, uh, generalists. So we certainly have made uh, investments that we're really excited about and proud of in the real estate tech and prop tech category, uh, one of which uh, we were just talking about remarkably, focus on multifamily real estate intelligent, intelligent analytics, uh, as well as jet closing, focus on the title and escrow space. Um, and our team has a long history of investing in, in prop tech well before it was called prop tech. My partner Jeff was on the board early on at Redfin and just really excited about a lot of the innovation that we're seeing, particularly here in the Northwest uh, around real estate technology and related investments. So um, I started uh, investing in real estate tech actually as a founder. I'm also from Seattle. Um, long before there was this prop tech in 1998, I founded a company here in Seattle called qubits.com. Um, I'm now working, um, having sort of traversed both real estate and technology uh, with a firm called Metaprop. Uh, Metaprop is an early stage prop tech focused venture firm uh, based out of New York City, um, but investing all over the world and with investing into Europe and Asia. Um, and our focus is really across the entire real estate life cycle. We've started um, with commercial, but what we've seen is an increasingly, uh, an ecosystem that's increasingly merging commercial and residential um, applications. Um, where I think our, uh, we, we started, you focused a lot on transaction efficiency, data management, data, um, data, bank frequency, data generation, uh, which on the commercial side is a little bit more opaque than it has been on the residential side. Um, and now we're really focused on, um, I think, uh, as, as, uh, um, uh, as Scott said, on, on things that are really using that information um, to sort of weaponize it, um, whether that's in AI, um, and or machine learning applications. And then we're particularly focused on what we call full stack solutions that provide end-to-end um, you know, -end services um, and increasingly focused on construction technology as well. So. Yeah, so Seven Peaks Ventures, we're an early stage venture fund. Um, so we invest uh, typically seed, series A, stage deals. Um, and we'll invest across a variety of sectors, uh, but real estate tech is one of them. Um, and uh, within the real estate tech space, we've we funded so far, I think, five or six companies in, in the space. Um, I co-founded CrowdStreet. That's one of our companies that we um, and but within there, <clears throat> you know, it's such a huge market and really big markets that have somehow avoided, um, you know, the disruptive uh, attack of entrepreneurs for as long as real estate has. Um, they're really target-rich environments to go invest into, so um, so we really like that. Um, but within it, I mean, we you know one of the a couple of themes that we're really interested in is one is the the digitization automation of workflow and transactions. Um, that's there's just a lot of opportunities you know for startups there. Um, and then on the kind of on the um, uh, really the the investment side of real estate, there's you know, a lot of opportunity because there's a whole democratization of access that's occurring. Yeah. Um, CrowdStreet was part of that journey, but um, but I think when you can take a market and kind of open it up and and allow investors to participate in it in, in ways they couldn't in the past, that always you know um, there's always a lot of demand for that. So so on the, on that particular point, I want to stick with you and I actually come back to you, Julie, as well on this question. That is that first half of this year. $3 billion has been invested in prop tech. That's, that's phenomenal. And when you look at the personalities here on stage and what they represent, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that is strategically focused on investing in 
the property technology industry. Is this, why, why now? What's fundamentally changed in the last like three to five years that it has commanded $3 billion to be invested in the first half of this year alone? Is this, is this a fad? Is this just a function of uh, liquidity in the market? What is, what's, what's the reasoning behind this? I don't think, I don't think it's a fad. It's, um, <clears throat> in fact, if you look at other big markets that have kind of somehow avoided uh, tech startups, you know, the, the healthcare industry, um, education industry, um, um, those of the healthcare industry has had a huge influx of, of, of venture dollars and startups that have been attacking problems in that space. Um, um, ed tech is harder because your your customers are bureaucratic entities. So, but real estate is this wonderfully disaggregated, <laughs> you know, ecosystem with all these different players, and that just creates you know interesting opportunities for startups and. Uh, and I think just today's software technologies are nimble enough where you can you can go create enterprise solutions and workflow solutions pretty pretty effectively. Um, so it's and there's a lot of money to be made. There's a, you know I, I think Chris had a great presentation before on a lot of the data, just the transactional data that that exists in this industry, and it's it's massive and um, uh, you know automating and disrupting pieces of that can lead to a lot of wealth creation. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm curious, Julie, from your perspective, because you invest across a broad spectrum of opportunities. Are you seeing that, hey, there's just a lot of cash that's going after just technology in general, or are you seeing this outlier in the real estate, in the real estate sector? Yeah, I think, I think there's, there's two effects at play. One is, uh, to your point, really general. The other, I think, is, is you know, very relevant to, to the real estate tech category. Generally speaking, I mean, there's just been an unbelievable flow of capital to alternative assets like venture capital and private equity. Limited partners all over the country are just pouring capital like you wouldn't believe into, into our industry. Actually, last year, uh, funds like mine, seed stage funds, um, that entire category saw the creation of 137 new seed funds in just one year with asset center management worth of $20 million. So, I mean, LPs can't find enough places to, to pocket this capital, and that, of course, drives a lot of competition, drives higher valuations, and thus higher you know, check sizes that ended up getting distributed to companies across sectors. In real estate, I think there's also just been a really neat evolution that we're seeing around behaviors, consumer behaviors, people who are uh, buying and leasing, uh, commercial behaviors. Uh, I think uh, we all read uh, on the edge of our seats that, uh, that we work S1 uh, this past week. There's just, there's a lot of really interesting dynamics happening. Um, and I think those two effects have led to a lot of what we're seeing over the past few years. So on that point, Ellie, is this sustainable? I mean, can, can we sustain as an industry this influx of capital? Is it, is it just chasing fleeting returns? Yeah, well, so I think that I'm going to sort of echo a couple of Julie's points. I think that we've seen a number of things that have led this to be, this, this to be different. Um, first of all is obviously just the massive influx of capital into the tech and venture space. Um, equally important is the consolidation of large parts of the um, real estate sort of stack, if you will, whether that's the big service companies or the big finance companies. Um, they've been consolidating over the last decades. And so you finally have these big enough targets that you can actually sort of shoot at. Um, the third area, I think, is that um, the stack of technologies that has changed the way that we do everything in work has really fundamentally impacted real estate. You know, real estate is by definition um, disaggregated, right? It's everywhere. Every, everywhere you look is real estate. And so mobility and the mobile revolution and the ability to both gather, distribute, and access data at any point in the world is particularly relevant to real estate because of its spread out nature. And finally, and I think this is the, um, you know, the thing that, will, um, that will, will actually allow this time to be different than the last few times, because I've watched a few cycles of prop tech come and go, um, is that the, um, this cycle has lasted long enough that enough capital has been raised, enough commitment has been made, that I think there's enough capital out there dedicated to or allocated to prop tech to see this generation of companies through a recession should it happen. In the past, what's happened is you've had, um, you know, whenever there's a bump in the market, uh, real estate people tend to be very conservative because they are protecting the largest store of value of wealth in the world. It's, it's you know, that doesn't pay to be risky, it pays to be conservative. And so whenever there's been a recession, people have moved away from technology. 
Now, I think because of all of this dedicated capital that's been raised, whether it's in early stage funds or bigger funds like Fifth Wall and um, other very, very large funds that are raising you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars, there's enough capital that actually has to be put out that it will actually take us over a recession and sustain us for a longer term. So on that line item of sustainability, I mean, Scott, this must be a boom time for you guys. You guys are <laughs> looking at all these new companies getting, getting capital, mm -hmm. you're evaluating tons of deals, and you, you're more of a strategic acquirer of this technology. This, is, this has got to be a, a great season. Yeah, th I, look, we're, we've, we've been doing this for 10 years now, um, and we're at 15 companies. Four of those have happened in the last eight months. So we've seen a lot of activity just this year alone. But sustainability, I, I've been in this business 20 years overall in, in real estate technology, um, and I've lived through the 2007 to 2009 bust. Uh, we saw a lot of companies disappear. Uh, a lot of companies have come back. I think we're at a, 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 a very strategic shift in the business. It was access to data, MLS data before. It was a little bit about technology on a desktop with a very you know, sort of non-tops-down non approach to buying. It happens at the real estate agent level. What we're actually seeing right now is these billions of dollars are being invested at, at high levels. You have SoftBank investing in Compass right, and doing technology there. You have Keller Williams announcing a you know, billion dollars worth of investment. Realogy and announcing their investment, hiring guys from Capital One to run Realogy. Companies like Remax buying technology companies. They're all buying, and I think they're moving to a world where technology is an asset and technology of getting closer to the consumer is the asset. Um, I'm excited by it because I actually don't think anybody can go it alone. So I'm very excited. It's, it's actually a bigger ecosystem for everybody in property tech. Uh, I think there's more money coming in, uh, and it, it will just create a much larger pie. That's, that's interesting, and, and I guess just to back up, uh, I'm sure a question that a lot of people have is, well, you know, we talk about these massive numbers, and you, you, all of you are coming from a, from a financial background. Many people in the audience are not coming from a financial background, they're coming from a practitioner background. So just simply put, where is this money coming from? Because you mentioned organizations like SoftBank. You meant, I mean, I think, I think we know where a lot of the capital comes from from a franchise perspective. You don't want to know. The, franchise. <laughs> the answer is you don't want to know. Okay. So, so, but, but we, we, we have a lot of money coming in, but, but really, really, where, what's generating this all? What's, I mean, is this sovereign wealth funds that are, that are hitting this? Is this, I mean, we're, we're talking, uh, Dino, I don't know if well, you want to talk a little bit about that. The, the private markets over the past, since, since really the, the, the meltdown in 01, you know, and, and Sarbanes-Oxley and uh, you know, a lot of those regulations that got passed, what they did is they made it very difficult for companies to go public back then. But, but what it also did is it, it's, it inspired like bigger funds to get created. The size of the private equity universe just exploded. And so it, it, it was way more logical for a lot, of, a lot of private companies to stay private and to stay private much longer. So if you look at, um, here's a simple analogy. So back in the prior era of tech companies, um, you look at the market caps of Microsoft, Cisco, um, companies like that, when they went public, they were in the four to eight hundred million dollar range. Link, you know, and then look at some of the market caps, initial market caps of companies that went public in the two thousands. You know, LinkedIn, Facebook, etc., multi billions, and 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 getting bigger. You know, so companies are staying private longer. Investors, therefore, the private investors can can participate in that uplift. Um, and, and do it as a private investment, and, and it's and it's just attracted a you know huge amount of capital from, you know, every source. You know, the, uh, 15, 15, 20 years ago, a typical family office might not have had more than a few percent of their allocation in venture and private equity. Today, it's upwards of 20 plus percent, and sometimes a lot higher than that. And they're chasing returns, right? They, they want to see returns on their yeah, portfolio. Yeah, they want, they want growth, they want returns, they want, um, um, and they want access to, to deals that to just aren't in the public markets. And, and by the time they get in the public markets, um, they're so over, a lot of times they feel so overpriced. Like, look at WeWork. Like, I mean, hopefully nobody in this audience is going to buy WeWork at the IPO because it, to me, it's a short. <laughs> It's so overvalued, it's, it's kind of crazy. And they've got $47 billion in lease, long-term lease obligations. It, that, that's an example of a company that just 
because the capital markets, even the private sector, chased deals. And they chased WeWork, they were the category leader, and they probably just jacked it up way too high in terms of its value. Um, and I think there'll be a correction there. So, so for some of the companies in here that are serving the real estate space that are in the process of raising capital, given the massive amounts available, does it matter where that capital comes from? I mean, is that a, uh, Ellie, you wanna, you wanna hit that one? Yeah, so I actually, um, I, I think the answer, by the way, is very much yes, um, because the institutional capital that is allocated and or specifically directed towards um, prop tech, uh, it will endure. Um, and it's important. Um, so I actually now live, having lived a lot of my life in New York after Seattle, um, I live in Dallas now, where a lot of the startups that come out of Dallas are um, funded primarily by family offices. Um, and while there are an enormous number of high net worth individuals and family offices um, in Dallas, for instance, um, the, it does not give them access to the sort of scaling A capabilities and support systems of the venture ecosystem and B, those long-term checks that are gonna be there um, no matter what. So I think that it is very important to, to uh, while, it, while it can really help, um, right now I actually think there's a, a sort of vacuum in the, what the terminology is confusing here as well, I'll nod, um, or the, the seed, pre-seed, sort of pre-product. Um, there's a vacuum there that's been filled by the family offices. I think it's very important for, people, for companies to, um, by the time they get to their A, um, have some really sophisticated institutional um, and venture capital alongside them. So, so investors do matter, and, and uh, Julie, I'm, I'm sure you, you see this quite a bit with people really pounding on your door saying, you know, help us, invest in us, because ostensibly the later stage investors are looking at who's, who was one of the original investors, right? So I mean, a lot of times you're behaving like a strategic, so money, money does matter, right? Uh, we hope so. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've invested a lot to you know, make sure we've got this whole suite of offerings uh, beyond just the person in your boardroom um, to, to make sure that there's a that sort of full stack of, of value to contribute. Uh, I mean, in the end, your average VC is going to be either really bad or really good at a, at a, a few set of things, you know, um, hiring, recruiting, connections to other investors, strategy, uh, company building. Um, but now all these firms are investing pretty aggressively in these value add services where you have uh, sort of a built-in systematized recruiting function or a PR function. At our firm, we've got engineering and design and product and marketing. And the idea being here, you, if you have an investor that's able to help in those ways, you have a leg up and that matters to future investors as well. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's, let's talk about, you know, what the money is chasing and some of the, some of the key themes that uh, not only that you're, that you're seeing come across your desk right now, but uh, where where's the market going to go in the next couple of years, Scott? I mean, you you see a lot of deal flow, right? Sure. Yeah, we, we see a lot of deal flow, um, and I I would say we're we're really chasing two things. It's it's very simple for us. So one. Right, it may actually sound boring, but it's just core business fundamentals. So I, I'm looking at companies that have a sales strategy. I'm looking for companies that have really strong customers, good lifetime value, uh, really sustainable customer acquisition costs, right? and quite frankly, a very pragmatic operating expense strategy. Right? So we, you know, we are we are looking for return on capital. We need to find those sound business fundamentals. So I will look across what I will call some of the boring stuff. The, the oxygen that has to run the business it might be your accounting system, but that's interesting and it's critical and it's important. Uh, and then on the other side, you know, I'm excited. We just did two acquisitions in the big data AI space. So we acquired a company called Offers and a company called SmartSim. Uh, both those companies are the leader. We're the, the, the two head-to-head -head leaders in residential real estate predictive analytics. They're both predicting who's going to sell their home next. Um, we're looking to do more and more of that because we believe um, getting much closer to the consumer. It was 10 or 12 years ago, it was all about the property, but that's all online now. Now it's really about the consumer and the, the decisions they'll make, whether that's buying a home, whether that's the transaction closing the home, or whether that's all the lifestyle and post-sale decisions they make. So what it, what it sounds like you're saying is that while the theme is important, the team and how they build the business is almost paramount, right? I mean, look, look, we've, we've acquired a lot of companies and we've looked at a lot of companies that had great ideas, um, Right, and a strong team, but just no core fundamentals on, on sales or strategy as well. Yeah, so you know, look, if you're, as you look at a business, um, you know, making sure there's something there where you can generate revenue and you have a sales strategy, um, I think is critical. Yeah. Dino, what, do what are you seeing out there that you're really, you're really after right now, theme-wise? Yeah, I mean, 
there's, there's probably two answers to that question. One is, yeah, there are some, some themes that we're interested in um, that, um, that are driven by trends, you know, like, like the digitization automation of workflow and, and that sort of thing. Um, but, but really, at, at its core, what I gave up, I've been, I've been in venture capital now for 21 years, and so I gave up trying to predict the future because what I found is that the smartest entrepreneurs are always closer to the future. So, um, so my strategy is just, just, you know, find the entrepreneurs that have figured something out that nobody else yet sees, and then invest in them. And um, more often than not, that leads you to, you know, really interesting kind of, uh, you know, business opportunities. And then, um, you know, obviously, it's it's all about the team. It's all about like, you know. Um, what kinds of capabilities and they can pull together? Um, can they figure out a really um, uh, clear go-to-market approach and strategy that just allows them to scale? So um, there's really a, a, just a hyper uh, prioritization in the industry on, on, within venture capital on you know, finding companies that found their way to scale um, uh, in as low a friction manner as possible. You can throw money at it and force it to scale, but that doesn't like result in a great business. Yeah. So let me let me sort of rephrase that question a little bit for Julie because uh, from that from a differing perspective, there's a lot of really cool technologies out there, and uh, some of the best technologies that we've seen in the real estate space weren't in the real estate space to begin with. They they came from solving big problems outside of real estate and were you know, brought into the space. So using your crystal ball or, or just what you're seeing coming across your desk, what's, what's exciting from a theme perspective? Oh my gosh, this question is a little awkward to answer in a room full of agents and brokers. Uh, so I'll caveat by saying that, but you know, I, I think there's just been a longstanding focus of disintermediation in the entire category, especially given some of the transaction sizes you see in prop tech, real estate tech, vis-a-vis -vis other areas that VCs are investing in. Um, so I mean, a lot of you know, the next generation of founders are, are, are coming after your lunch as founders. A lot of you are entrepreneurs in here too. Um, I was you know, walking with someone on the way in, um, talking about the importance of um, really understanding what's special with your work, with your business, what you can contribute to the customer experience that none of these founders necessarily can create with their software. I think that's really important to hold on to. We do believe that you know, agents and brokers and insurance providers will be a really critical component of the ecosystem when it comes to both real, uh, residential and commercial real estate transactions moving forward. So we get really excited when we see about founders who are thoughtful about partnering very well in that ecosystem. Um, but in the end, I think the long-term game comes through that sort of private peer-to-peer -peer approach that a lot of these private sale companies today are focused on in the res on, the re on the residential side anyway. Allow me to disagree. Mm. <laughs> um, so while I do think that there is certainly some parts of the business that will be, di be disintermediated, you know, my thesis is that um, disintermediation happens when transactions are frequent, um, when they're standard, and then we're, when they're relatively small. Um, either financially or emotionally to the parties involved. Um, I think for many, particularly on the residential side of transactions and on the buy side in particular, um, these transactions are infrequent. They are not standard to the buyer, or to the buyer and they're a deeply emotional process and um, there is a human touch there that cannot be sort of financialized out. I think the I buyers are, fin are financializing, are sort of aggregating and financializing sort of the sell side. But I think that the buy side, I think that that human touch is going to continue to be important in the long term. Um, and I say that as somebody who's tried for years to disintermediate parts of this business. Um, but there's some parts that I think the, the human touch is, is really important. It's tough. And, and as was mentioned in you know, the very first session yesterday, this is a highly, highly fragmented market. And so there's a lot of problems that need to be solved and a lot of ideas that probably come across all of your desks every day. And you've got it. You've got it at the end of the day, sort of thumbs up or thumbs down. So let me, let me change that question around. That's, and that is, what gets an immediate no from you? Like, what types of ideas? Nope. Next. Ellie? A small point solution inside of a large transaction, and sort of, sorry, of a large process. Um, we've seen a lot of those things um, get funded over the years. Um, now, people like Scott are rolling them up, which is where I think they belong. 
Um, so I think it's going to be difficult for people to find um, sort of I'm fixing this one little this one little problem. Um, it's got to sit in the context of a larger nest, nested problem. Do you know what gets an immediate no from you? Oh, just I mean, small market opportunities, narrow points of differentiation, uh, the wrong team DNA. Um, you know, there's so many. I mean, you know, we, you know, for most venture funds, you know, you probably see. 500 or more deals a year, and you might invest in four or five. So you say no, like, really often. Um, but um, so, you, so we're looking for just those, the setup. The setup of, you know, market opportunity where there's, it's not so crowded where the startup has some maneuvering room while they're getting going uh, to figure it out. Um, the setup of having you know, the right kind of experienced founding team that has their head screwed on straight, that has the right strategy, and they want to build something of lasting value, not just a flip. Um, you know, just the setup is kind of how I kind of talk about it. Um, and, and it's like when you get enough of those elements in place, then it just, you start, you wake up every day, and you're like, wow, I'm more, every day I seem to be more interested in that deal. And and then you, that ends up being a company that you end up funding. So persistence matters, and thinking big matters, right? And Scott, Julie, I want to leave you with the last, last two words here, because I think that uh, this is really important for the future of the space, and that is you know, if, if persistence matters and the idea matters, and you're saying no to, I don't know, how many, uh, how many deals you have to say no to before you say yes, Right? And these founders, what's the best way for these founders to, to get your attention, to get you off the seat to write a check for them? What is, what's, what's the way to do that? It'll be, I think, a nice comparison because we're investing at the very, very beginning of these stories and, and Scott at the, at the end, so to speak, um, although the beginning in, in your world. Um, you know, from, from a high level standpoint, it comes down to the people. You want to have the sense that the person across the table from you is just the inevitable entrepreneur, the inevitable human built being based on their experience, passion, knowledge, team building capacity to execute against a particular market opportunity. Uh, if that's not there, it's a no. Um, when it is there, it increases the odds, but even beyond that, you really have to feel there's just something magical that this person can build that just jives so nicely with who they are. Right. Okay, yeah, and, and I would add, mine, mine might be a, a little more boring as well, but to me, it's, it's really just two things. Is there a business model there? Is there revenue? Right? Can you prove there's revenue? So that what will give me a no, is, or what I will give a no to is somebody who says, if you buy us, we will be successful. That's not interesting. Right? Show, show me that you've got a business and a viable model, and then I want to talk to the customers. Right? So before we do any acquisition, we do deep due diligence um, with large customers and ensure that there's actually a viable product there. So you have revenue, you have a customer base, and then we are you know, along the way evaluating the, the staff always, right? You're, you're in front of these folks because they're good entrepreneurs. So generally you're always finding good entrepreneurs there. So keep it simple, love it. Yeah, keep it simple. Well, Scott, Julie, Ellie Dino, thank you so much for being on stage with us and sharing your thoughts on where we are, where we're going, and where the money's flowing. Thank you all for being a wonderful audience. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.